Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. The early birds. <laughs> Try to be. If you're not early, you're late, right? That's that's it. I'm excited about this class actually, because um, there's a lot of even seasoned realtors, you know, don't know what goes behind the underwriting process, um, and that's why you have the conversation of okay, we do the standardized underwriting where you just plug in numbers and data. And then for those that don't fit that mold in that criteria, we have the manual one. So Derek, you're so, you're so spot on with that. And I'll tell you that, as you can see, I've been, uh, I've been, as you can see by what's left of the hair on my head, I've been doing, this for, <laughs> I've been doing this for 35 years. And um, Jen Sweeney, our underwriter, who's uh, just joined us, will tell you, I call her every day. <laughs> what about this? What if we look at this? How would you look at that? Um, so it's a um, there's a science to it, and there's some mechanics to it, but there's also a, you know an art form to it as well. So I th I, I think I'm looking forward to the call uh, as well, and I think hopefully you'll come away. Oh, it was um Lewis. I'm, that's who. I'm yes. Thinking. Yeah, that's me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think you'll come away with some good stuff. Okay. Good morning, Jen. Good morning, everybody. How are we? Friday. Good. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Okay. We're just a little before 11, so I guess I want to give a couple minutes for some people to still join. Absolutely. Anybody else besides me excited for fall? I have my pumpkin spice latte. <laughs> Same. <laughs> it, um, I am loving this uh, crisp clear low hu low humidity weather yes oh uh, it's the best i love fall <laughs> i saw um on facebook one of my friends was in the supermarket and she showed a uh, pumpkin flavored pasta sauce uh no um no sorry no <laughs> i think that's taken it a little too far I think the only pumpkin thing I do eat is pumpkin pie or I'll drink the pumpkin coffee. Otherwise, I don't I actually don't like anything else pumpkin. <laughs> well, pumpkin pasta sauce, that's that mm -hmm. would be a hard no for me. I'm Italian. That hurts my feelings. Yeah, I'll, it's I'll, pass on that. I'll pass on that, too. <laughs> yeah. uh, be, be, uh, be, beer with the pumpkin spice. I, I'm all, all about it but for Oktoberfest, but I'll pass on the pasta. Yeah. <laughs> Let's give it another minute or two, Jen. Yeah, I don't even see Alyssa on here yet. No, I don't either. I was just going to text her. But we've got a nice uh, we've got a nice group here, so glad to see the attendance. Excuse me, uh, Jen. If you don't mind, because I might not be able to ask questions later. Sure. Um, would, can you speak on how to become an underwriter? Because that's something I'm very interested in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when I, I'll, I'll talk about that when I go through my intro. Thank you. So it's the first thing I go over for you, okay? Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, here comes Alyssa. Hi, Jim. Um, this is Kim, the virtual assistant. So who's going to be the host of this um, meeting or class? Uh, Alyssa Chapnick. Okay, I'll be making her the host now. Thank okay, you. Okay, th thank you, thank you. Alyssa, I see you're on. There you are. Hear me? Good morning, yes. Good morning. Technical difficulties. I hope everybody was able to get on. I know some people were having an issue with the password. Um. Yeah, the initial just, link I had to click like a redirect, but I think I think yeah, everybody may have maybe having the same issue because I also had issues trying to log into this um, Zoom call with the meeting ID. If you want to reshare it with the whole group, I don't know how if you'll have to email a blast. 
Yeah, let's just give it a few minutes. I'm going to reshare it on the page again. Let's just give it a few minutes, see if anybody else hops on. Carmen, I said I was happy to see you today. I don't think we've ever officially met. No, we haven't. We talked <laughs> on the phone though, right? Yeah. And just for the record, the baby boomer had no problem getting on. <laughs> it was only the millennials that had the problem. I guess that's where I should say my son started the Zoom meeting for me. He's seven. He he works my laptop <laughs> better than I do. Uh, that's a riot. Yeah, just let me know when you share that, Alyssa, so I know when we. Yeah, I'm gonna. Ready. I'm gonna share it now um, on the Facebook page. If you maybe just want to start with like introducing. Okay. Yeah, so um, obviously I'm gonna introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jen Sweeney. I am an underwriter here with the Malone branch at Finance of America. Um, sad to say this, I've actually been underwriting or in the mortgage industry for more than half my life. So uh, as I am young, uh, I still have been doing this for, I think I tried to calculate it the other day, 18 years, which is a long time. Um, but I did not start as an underwriter. So uh, to those looking into how how do you get to that point? Um, I actually started at a title company uh, that worked closely with PHH Mortgage. So I did that right out of high school. And from there, I guess curiosity just set in. Obviously, a lot of your employment is driven by money. So everybody was making really good money at the time. Um, and I just kind of moved over to the mortgage side. So I started as a loan processing assistant. Um, and then I started doing a little bit of underwriting assistant as well and kind of just moved up from there. So uh, it is, as you guys know, as realtors, uh, very cutthroat. I mean, you're constantly moving around, doing stuff, business relationships. The volume is always crazy. So just as hectic on this side as I'm sure it is on your side, um, but I love it. Uh, as many times as I've left after having kids, I come right back to it. So I'll have to say that it's, you know, as crazy as it can be, it's also a very fulfilling job here. Um, me personally, I like the puzzle fitting. So to me, every loan is unique. I don't really have the same scenario twice. Uh, so it gives you a lot of time to, you know, kind of think and put your mind to use, which is what I like here. So, um, I, again, work for the Malone branch, as you could tell, I, you know, Jim, Melissa, and I were very close. I am with all of my loan officers. I love our branch. We are made up of two processors, one closer, one underwriter, and we do a lot of volume and we do it very well. So um, I'll have to say one of the good things that we bring to the table, we work very closely as a team. Everybody puts in their part um, and we get loans to close on time as quickly as possible and as smoothly as we possibly can. Okay, so um, I know you guys are here to learn a little bit more about underwriting. Um, there are a lot of pieces to this that are forever changing. So to me, um, like Jim said, there is still a lot of stuff I have to learn. There's stuff that's ever changing. Guidelines are constantly changing, especially with COVID. You know, all these overlays are constantly coming out. So uh, sometimes it can make the process a little bit harder because you did something once and you're like, oh, I'm just going to follow through what I did the last time. And guess what? Maybe completely different for your borrower. So, um, so many different pieces can come in that will change the interpretation of something. Um, you know, there's a lot of gray area in underwriting. I'll put it that way. So where we see guidelines, certain things may be black and white. A lot of it may be, mm, we kind of have to put our heads together and figure out the best way to deal with a certain scenario. So um, my best practice or something that I would suggest that you guys do, always be upfront, speak to your loan officer. If there's anything that you know or hear of, doesn't necessarily have to make it on an underwriter's desk, but having that conversation is always a good thing. So your loan officer knows, hey, maybe there might be something else that we should be asking for, or is there some conversation I should be having then with the client to kind of guide them on where they should be going. So um, one of the things that I did draw up uh, for today that uh, hopefully I'll be able to share with you guys um, is just kind of like a, a, a buyer 101. So there's some things that we like to, you know, kind of 
give your client an idea of what may or may not happen in the process that could, you know, kind of throw a kink in our process here or whether or not it's going to impact their approval with us. So obviously we get a pre-approval with your loan officer. Once we step into the actual process, just kind of like to give you a few tidbits on things to do and not to do. Um, one of those would be opening new debts. Obviously we're calculating your debt to income. We wanna make sure that you qualify. Every loan program has different ratios that they go off of, um, but buyer gets really excited. They're like, I can't wait to furnish this home. Goes out to Ashley Home Store. $5,000 on a credit card, their new payment's 50 bucks a month. That can easily throw a wrench in whether or not we're approving your loan, okay? Having to pay off new things at the closing table is never really where you want to go, especially when the buyers are putting down the minimum amount of money. So um, that's always my first thing. I always say, tell, tell your borrower, tell your buyer, really be conscious of what new debt you may be opening. We Within 10 days of closing, we'll refresh your credit so we see any new inquiry. You go to the store and you're like, oh, I just want to get that 10% off at Home Depot. I'm going to have them run my credit, but I really won't open the credit card. We're going to question it. So let's make sure that they're conscious of those kind of things. Um, same thing with your employment. You know, you have a, a client that's like, oh, I've been working here for 15 years. I make this amount of money, but you know what? Times are changing and Bank of America offered me 20 grand more a year. Well, that's great. But if we go to call your employer and verify you're still employed, two days prior to closing, we find out you don't work there, that's definitely delaying your closing. So um, new jobs, we could still do that. It's not going to you know, totally cut us off from the process, but there's a lot of documentation, possibility of having to wait to receive your first paycheck, which could, depending on how long or how often they get paid, delay your closing a few weeks, um, which is something we don't want on any side. I'm sure that the seller you know, is reluctant to want to push their closing as well. Perfect so example of communication. If they don't tell us mm -hmm. about it, it's going to be a problem. If they do tell us about it, we're going to be able to work with it. One yeah. thing I wanted to throw in here, Jen, is we've had a lot of deals where, um, new for me, haven't done this a long time, our guidelines for using future income are, are pretty flexible. So we've had a bunch of, and Alyssa's shaking her head up and down, uh, yeah. Used to not you used to have to wait for the person to get their first pay stub in the new job. If it's a bait, if it's a straight up salary position, we've done a few, uh, a couple lawyers and stuff where we were able to just close them. We just had one last month, and he was starting in a few weeks, and it was it was no problem. But the communication was there. Yep. Yeah. So I mean, if we know up front, we know when they're going to start. Uh, typically, we say thirty days. So if we have an offer letter and they're going to start within thirty days. As long as that offer is not contingent on the completion of something that we can't verify, no reason why we can't move forward. We know you're going to earn that money. Um, you know, it's again, having that line of communication open and letting everyone know as early as possible in the process what documentation we may or may not need. So there is no last minute scramble. Uh, there is not one person in this entire process from the realtors to the closers that likes to scramble the day before closing. So again, open line of communication on all parties. Um, I'll be the first to say there are things obviously an underwriter doesn't want to see, but that doesn't mean that you can't have that conversation with your loan officer. So then, you know, they can make the determination of how far does this need to go and what should we do up front to make sure it doesn't impact anything on our day of closing. Do we have any questions so far? Okay, uh, two other things I wanna go over and that's really asset-based. Obviously it's very important to make sure that our buyers can pay what needs to be paid at the closing table. So whether they're you know, just paying their closing costs or if it's you know, some type of down payment that they're required, we source everything. So when your bank statements are coming through, we're gonna look at every deposit, every withdrawal, anything that seems like it doesn't make sense, um, then an underwriter is potentially going to question that. So um, two things I commonly see that may uh, impact your loan is large deposits and gifts. So to, to me, as a conventional underwriter, I'm looking at anything 
that is 50% of your gross monthly income. So if you're making $5,000 a month and you deposit it something over $2,500, I'm gonna have to see where it came from. If we can back out the money and you don't need it, that's great, but let's be honest, nine times out of 10, that's not how it works. So if they are liquidating funds from any type of retirement to be proactive, we're gonna have to see the source of where that came from. If they're getting a gift, it can't just be from my cousin. Again, I'm a Philly girl, I'm Italian. I have about 3000 cousins running around here. So it's not really an acceptable thing to just say, oh, hey, well, I've known this guy for a really long time. He's gonna give me 10 grand. There's guidelines that tell us we can't do that. So typically when you're getting a gift, it has to come from a spouse, a fiance, a domestic partner, someone that's blood related and that we can determine that there really is that relationship there. I shouldn't yeah. be getting a gift from someone that's just, oh, it's my uncle's best friend, but I've known him since I was two years old. Unfortunately, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, they tell us that's not acceptable. Can I jump on that again? Yeah. That's another one where, uh, first of all, is Carmen one of your cousins and can he give you a gift? No. Okay. Carmen's friends with a cousin of mine, okay. but yes. Um, but uh, communi two things, communication is the key. So, uh, you know, as loan officers, and I know as soon as I start talking, unless it's gonna start shaking her head up and down, you know, we help uh, frequently help to structure the gift uh, upfront. As, um, and as realtors, I think that the best guidance you can give to your customers is, you know, be really straight up with your loan officer, let them know what's going on. And, you know, you can start getting into where the money's coming from. And, and if the terminology of gift comes up, you can strongly reinforce what Jen just said, which is, you know, talk to your loan officer, make sure that it's going to, you know, uh, fit in all the boxes. The other thing I just wanted to mention that when Jen talks about we have to do this and we have to question these um, large deposits, that's not just finance in America. That's a straight up standard Fannie Mae guideline. So, uh, you know, 99 out of 100 lenders who you uh, work with are going to be following these guidelines. If you, you know, if you go to Prudential Savings Bank in South Philly and they're lending you their money, they might be able to make up their own guidelines. But, uh, you know, huge percentage of any lender that uh, that you talk to is going to be doing the same things that Jen is talking about. Yeah. And just to touch on that, I mean, I've actually underwritten at quite a few companies. Um, some, like I said, I, I used to be at PHH. That was an extremely large company. I also worked for credit unions, which like Jim said, they hold their own money so they can kind of make a little bit more room for wiggle um, if they are holding and servicing their own loans. Unfortunately, uh, once TRID rules came out, and that's just kind of something that we look at on our end, they've kind of tightened the reins on that. So when you get a mortgage company that's saying, oh, well, underwriting really wants to see this and they really want to see that, and you know the borrower's getting frustrated with the process, let them know this, like Jim said, this is uniform. Every company is doing it. And um, if they're thinking like, oh, I don't wanna deal with this. I'm just gonna go to Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo is gonna do the same thing. So here at Finance of America, we actually don't have our own overlays. We go off of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. We conform straight to the guidelines. So if Fannie Mae tells us we have to do it, we're doing it. If they don't, we're not. So um, there, there's really one of the pluses for us is that we don't have any overlays and there's no extra things that we would be doing that another company wouldn't also be doing, okay? Um, one of the perks to having that open communication with your loan officer is their experience. They've seen this before. They may have come across this scenario or somebody within our branch may have. So if your borrower is saying, well, you know, I have this guy in my family and I call him my uncle, but he's really not my uncle. Why can't he give me $25,000? You know, he's willing to do it. If they have assets that are sitting in a retirement account that they don't want to liquidate, we may still be able to use those and verify those as your assets and guide you along of, hey, you can get that gift, but don't deposit it until we fully clear your loan, you know, things like that. So we do have the experience here to kind of give you the direction you need and have that conversation with your borrower that we may know a workaround or something that we can do that could still get you from point A to point B, but it's not gonna throw a wrench in our process here 
or potentially impact your loan approval. Okay. Does that make sense to everyone? Jen, and I also just wanted to add in, I actually used to work at Wells Fargo. Yeah. And they were super strict and the underwriter was like, they never wanted to talk to you. They just wanted to clear your loan. That was it. Um, but they would kind of look for reasons why to decline a loan. Whereas mm -hmm. it's nice because you're in house here at our branch and you are a human. Yeah. You have feelings and you don't want to turn down loans. You're looking for reasons to approve them, not to turn them down, which is really nice. Yeah. Well, um, one of the things I hope you guys really take away from, you know, being here today is like Alyssa said, I think sometimes underwriters get a bad rep. I say I'm an underwriter and people look at me like I was that mean teacher in high school that everybody was like, oh man, I'm in her classroom. I hate that. That's not me. Uh, I'm the first to pick up the phone have a conversation with the loan officer, talk to my branch manager, what can we do to get this loan to closing? So, um, you know, and, and I'll say that to anyone that knows us here at the Malone branch, that's really our motive. Um, we want to give the best customer experience. We want to close these loans. I'm not keeping this roof over my head if I'm declining them all. I'm not taking my kids out to McDonald's three times a week if I have no money in the bank. So, Obviously, we, we, we need the business. We want the business. Um, we're going to do what we can. And not just because of the money and because of closing loans. We're here for our clients. We, we want to have that relationship. We want to continue you know, to have those relationships with you guys as well and show you that we do work hard and, and we want to get those loans to closing and we want to have a really good experience with all parties involved. Okay. So um, like I said about those gifts, I mean, you guys have questions talk to the loan officer. There may be some workarounds and things that we can do or conversations we can have up front so that we know what to expect during the process. Um, one of the biggest things right now, and especially with COVID, I think is your self-employed borrowers. There is a lot of what ifs. Uh, a lot of businesses did see a huge impact um, because of the closures or because of things that may not have you know, been able to be done with COVID going around. So um, I do just want to stress just because you have a borrower who is self-employed and may have come across certain downfalls, it doesn't mean we can't do the loan. So have those conversations, um, you know, give us as much information up front because there may be a workaround or um, I know typically we want to see self-employed with two years, but somebody who may have just started their business could just as very well get an approval from us. Um, to give you an example, I actually just had a loan where the guy just opened his business last year, but he was the veterinarian there for 15 years and decided to buy the business out. So um, I don't want anyone to feel like, oh, I've had this before, we can't do it and just say no. Um, you know, there's, there's always things that we could potentially do or even tell your client, hey, we may not be able to do this now, but in three months from now we can. If we have six months under our belt, I can speak to this scenario and I can, you know, maybe convince them like, here, here's some things that may have happened that are positive factors or what we like to call a compensating factor to give me the okay to accept what, what you have. So um, again, I really just think conversation is key because in the last year and a half, I think I've learned more about the mortgage industry than I have in the 17, 18 years I've been doing this. So um, times are changing, things are changing. And I think Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are trying to conform a little bit more to the norm here and the things that you know we've seen where the industry is going and what's typical for people. So um, again, just have the conversation because there could be workarounds or things that we would be willing to accept to continue to keep your borrowers eligible. Okay. Jan, can I can I piggyback on that? I would yeah. say if I, if I was a real estate agent, um, I would never tell a customer, no, you're not going to be able to get a loan until at least three mortgage companies had told me no. Um, I think Jen will tell you that um, I never think the answer is no. Mm -mm. <laughs> uh, you know, I'll have to hear it no like four or five times before I think the answer might be no. Mm 
you know, we're challenging one thing right now, and uh, and it's it's all done in very uh, you know a good team collaborative spirit. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, you know, customers are precious, and if you're the one who's um, diligent enough to you know keep going after it, and on the third time you find somebody who will say yes, um, and you get it done for them, that's a customer for life for you. So. Um, but just be cautious uh, that the person that's saying yes to you, it, you know, really knows what they're talking about. Yeah, agreed. Um, I think you guys, uh, being a realtor, can can speak to this as well. Uh, to me, I feel like this is one of the businesses, uh, you know, where there really isn't a lot of loyalty. As much as you would like to say there is, I feel like there's not. Um, me personally, if somebody came to me and said, "Oh, I could do it for five thousand. I can do it for 3000. I don't know, 3000 sounds way better to me and I'm not really knowledgeable enough to know what goes into that entire process. So most people are just going to go with whoever gives them the better answer. Um, one of the things that we really thrive on here in the Malone branch is that customer service. You have that tough loan, you have that unique scenario, something that you feel like may or may not work. I'm going to tell you we're going to work our tails off to make sure that we're giving you that good experience and getting that yes answer and pushing that loan to closing so um it, it's one of the reasons i love this branch it's one of the reasons i love doing what i do is because we do want to make the customers happy we want to make sure that when they walk away and they you know go into their house for the first night they don't go man that was the worst experience i ever had i'm just so glad to be in this house i want them to say hey you know that was kind of tough but Everybody pulled through and we made it here and, or that was a great experience. You know, the last time I bought a house, it was terrible. And, you know, this was completely different this time. So um, again, one of the things I want you guys to take away from this is underwriting may be a little bit of a scary process, but it's a necessity to this, you know, industry. And there are things that can or cannot be done to, you know, make it not so terrible. So, um, I just, again, feel like communication is a huge, huge thing for me. So um, the only other thing I really wanted to uh, point out was um, your property types. So there are a lot of times I do see where uh, most people, even the buyer themselves, had no idea they were walking into a condo. Uh, you know, they just figure it's a house or it might be a planned unit. Um, we do verify all that, and there's actually additional documentation that we have to get from the associations that we can't close without. So um, if you're, you know, somewhere in a community and you know there's an HOA, let us know that up front. Sometimes title's wrong. Sometimes your agreement of sale may not have that check mark, and we're completely unaware until we get your appraisal or until we get the title work in. Um, and those can delay. Unfortunately, a lot of associations use property management companies that could take two to three weeks to give us docs that we need. So um, knowing things up front really is just um, really important for us so that it gives us the time to get the documentation we need and make sure that we, again, are not throwing the wrench in a couple of days prior to closing where everyone's scrambling like we had no idea. Now we have to get this and, you know, there's a possibility we can't close on time. Hey Jen, this group will this group is going to get that right 100 percent of the time. Uh oh, is everybody in the condo? The condo shop <laughs> and uh, KW Philly, uh, you know, their agreement of sale. If it says it's a condo, it's a condo. If it says it's, if it says it's a put, it's a put. So they're uh, but you know, it's good for you guys to hear that. Um, you know, I just had one in uh in the county where the agent didn't tell me it was a condo. Mm -hmm. I looked at the agreement of sale. It wasn't a condo. Guess what? It was a condo. So, you know, this these guys are, are uh, consistently 100 percent of the time getting that oh, right. Good. Right, everybody. Scratch off what I just said, then Vicky, uh, Vicky Carey would uh, freak out on you if you're not doing your agreement to sale right. So that's funny. And um, so uh, last thing, um, something I've seen a little bit more often lately um, is frozen credit. A lot of times the borrowers think, oh, well, you know what? I'm getting my credit pulled so many times and things like that, or I just had something happen. I'm going to freeze my credit. We can't do that here. Um, I know Fannie Mae may have certain guidelines to say, well, if we could still get one score, then you know we could do it. 
That's one of the things that Finance of America won't do. So we pull a tri-merge credit report. If any of those three bureaus are frozen, we're going to make you unfreeze it, and it has to be unfrozen throughout the entire process. We do refresh your credit, like I said, so that's something where we're looking for additional inquiries or debts that may have come up since we initially pulled your credit. Um, one of the good things I like that has since left now that COVID starting to ease up a little is we can count our documents for 120 days. So we're not constantly asking for updated pay stubs, bank statements, credit report. But because we pulled your credit two months ago, we do want to make sure you didn't go out and run your credit 15 times and open 10 new credit cards that we're not aware of. So um, with that credit refresh, if there is any portion of your credit that's frozen, we can't pull it. So it is a little bit frustrating to the client when we have to keep telling them, no, you now have to call TransUnion go unfreeze your credit, it will take 24 to 48 hours for that to come off. So letting them know up front, hey, during this process, you know, if you're applying for a mortgage, we need to make sure we're able to pull your credit. So if you had a freeze, you have to completely take that off your credit for the entire duration until your loan closes. Um, so I think that's really valuable information. I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of an agent and I'm you know, picturing myself at a buyer consult where you're, where you're meeting the borrower and you're trying to uh, help prep them for the whole process. And this is great information. Uh, you can let them know that, you know, when you start working with the lender, if any of your uh, credit repositories are frozen, you're going to have to, uh, they're going to require that you open that up for the full duration of the loan. Mm -hmm. I think it's really good to let them know that we're doing that credit refresh at the end that's required, but also let them know that that does not result in a hard uh, inquiry. The only, uh, there will only be an inquiry when the initial credit is pulled, but it's still uh, gonna have to be open in order for us to do that final piece and get the loan cleared for closing. So I think it's a great piece of information for you guys to be able to step up and provide value to the customers right in the beginning of the process, because you're the first ones to come in contact with them and you're, you're in the best position to, to guide them to do uh, the things that are gonna make the process go more smoothly for them. So that's, that's a really nice tidbit. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, um, my husband will tell you, I work from home. He sits near me in the living room some days when I'm working. He still can't tell you half of what I do. So even for someone that works so closely, you know, to someone in this business, the consumer nine times out of 10 has no idea. We don't expect them to. That's why we're in this industry and they're not. So, you know, giving them that piece of information up front, I feel like is really critical because for you as a realtor, if you're giving them just a, a few hints, reminders, little, you know, like I said, best practices, client has no kinks throughout, throughout the process. What are they thinking? Man, that realtor told me all this stuff and, you know, that was so helpful. I didn't do any of this and we had no problems. So, you know, I understand we don't expect you to, to, to do our job, but these are things that may be beneficial to you as well because you're giving them the helpful information up front so that there are no speed bumps along the way okay um does anybody have any questions for me i have one i do oh sorry am i no go ahead okay so um some of my clients they are like they were international students and after they graduated they find a job here but like as Chinese, um, the lifestyle they have is like their parents support them for the down payment. Okay. And the down payment probably be like 100K or 200K. Like that's huge amount of gift. And some of them transferred from China and some of them, the, some of them like transfer when they get here for school. Like, okay. will they, like what kind of documents do they need to have this like gift? approved. As so I actually see it quite often. Um, we do have a, a loan officer in branch um, that sees a lot of similarities to that. Um, mm -hmm. What I will say, uh, they just sent out a, a guideline update. We do not do any loans where they have a foreign address. So if they have moved here and they can produce a U.S. residency address, um, then we're fine there as long as we can, again, pull your credit and have that bit of information. What I personally would look for 
we need to have the two-year employment history. If they don't have two years and they can show that they were a student, sometimes we'll either ask for a copy of uh, like their transcripts or their diploma just so that we can document the reason they don't have a two-year work history. Okay. If they're getting the gift, um, as long as they're meeting down payment requirements and they're getting a gift from an acceptable donor, there really isn't a limit to the amount. So if you are getting a conventional loan, it's a primary residence mm -hmm. or it's a one unit, then there is no minimum down payment that the borrower is required to put down. If they have a two to four unit, even if it's a primary, they have to put 5% of their own funds. So as long as they're meeting those, um, then the rest of the gift can come from an acceptable source. So let's just say they have to put down $100,000 at closing, but 5% has to come from their own funds. The rest of it can certainly come from a gift donor, but we do have to source it. So let's say their parents still are not residing in the United States and they may live, you know, uh, somewhere overseas. Mm -hmm. We will have to get a clear copy of the check or proof of the wire. Typically we'll see those come through as a wire. Yeah. So we just get a copy of the wire transcript, see mm -hmm. the deposit into the borrower's account. They send us a copy of the wire. Um, I forget the name. Uh, I always see it from a certain bank in Korea that I get, and it does come in Korean as well as English. So we don't even need to get a transcript that mm -hmm. wires in both languages. So it's nice um, because then we're not having someone translate a document for us. Okay. Mm -hmm. The, the thing that we like to do when we source is make sure we can see where the funds are coming from. Um, so if we're getting a gift from mom, that wire deposit really should have mom's name on it um, so mm -hmm. that we could tell that's exactly where that wire originated. Conventional does not require donor ability, so we're not really looking for those bank statements unless the funds cannot document exactly where they originated. Um, so to give you an example, if there was a time where both mom and son mm -hmm. have the same financial institution and they just transferred through online banking. Mm -hmm. I'm probably going to need to see their bank statements if I can't tell that's where the funds originated from. Otherwise, um, I always say a wire transfer or a check is your best method because that's easily traceable. We get a clear copy of the check. We know the funds came out of the account. Then we don't need to see anything. Um, a lot of times a gift donor feels like we're being a little too invasive. So mm -hmm. that's the plus with a conventional loan mm -hmm. is that when you have a gift, we're not really trying to dig through their finances as well to kind of see that original source. Um, unfortunately, some government loans and some bond products may ask for donor ability. Um, so if you know that you have an FHA loan or if we have a jumbo loan, they're probably going to want to see the donor's bank statements for at least 30 days. And that's just to make sure that there wasn't a large cash deposit or some type of liquidation of their own assets that was deposited right prior to giving the funds to our borrower, okay? Okay, is there any visa status limitations at your, your, your company? Uh, we do have a visa policy and honestly, there's a lot listed on there um, that we do accept. I can't offhand think of any that we do not. Um, I know the H-1B visas are normally what we see. Yeah. Um, the same thing with like a permanent resident, as long as we have your card, there have been a lot of delays, I guess, with COVID going on, people weren't able to, um, I guess, renew some of them, as long as we could see the application for renewal, then okay. that's still acceptable. I think right now the applications are running 18 months is what I saw on the last one. So yeah. let's just say it expired this month you mm -hmm. applied for the renewal, I want to say it's good for another 18 months because of the delays that are going on. Do we check F1 visa, which is- I can check and find out for you um, yeah. and let them know because again, I think every product is different. Um, I only underwrite mm -hmm. conventional loans, so I can kind of give you a little bit of an idea. Yeah. But you, you said the F visa? F1. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's good. Good. Anyway. yeah, go ahead. 
Ava, that's a perfect example of communication. So here, yeah. um, you know, we're privileged. I think the we get the question from the agent. They say, this is what the person has. We hang yeah. up from you. We call Jen. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> we look at the guideline together, but it, it's important. There's clear, there's a real clear line of communication um, and access. And uh, yeah. Alyssa, who's been at uh, Wells Fargo, uh, very well knows that that is not always the case. You know, sometimes you a they won't get you won't get an answer, or three days later you get an answer, yeah. and th three days that's like a you know that's an eon in the in the real estate world. So nobody wants to wait that long, and um, so we'll we'll get that one checked out for you. The F one. But is there any others that you're familiar with that you want me to look into as well, or is that just the one that's coming to mind? Um, so um, most of the customer I have they hold a F1 visa and okay. their family can support them with even like cash buyers, you know, they can okay. pay full amount of the house. But this thing they want to do is that if they buy a house with cash, can they do home equity loan to cash out and buy mm -hmm. another one? You know, if if they buy a house with cash, they won't, won't be able to leverage that, you know, yeah, the mortgage as a as a powerful tool to buy more and more. Okay, so that's no, a, I get what you're saying. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure. Um, you know, again, I used to work at a credit union, and and home equities is one of the things that I work with. Their guidelines are just uh, very similar to that. So if they're looking to, you know, take that cash out and and use that home equity to to then maybe purchase another home, um, yeah. they're going to have similar guidelines as yeah. far as what they're looking for. So um, what I'll do is I'll try and give you guys, um, I'll send it to either Jim or Alyssa to pass along. It's just a quick overview of the acceptable visas in a couple different products, as well as the conventional, just so that you, you kind of know which, which way you can go. I'm okay. gonna assume uh, with the type of information you're giving me, most of your clients do go conventional and they don't need to have the government products, um, but I'll still put it out there just in case anyone comes across it. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? I do. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. I have a question regarding overtime. Um, I tend to get different answers from different companies. Um, if someone has overtime employment consistently for a year, is that considered part of their income? Uh, or since so it's overtime, you can't include it. At qualifying income to us, uh, when you have variable income, which would be bonus, overtime, commission, anyone that's not working a straight 80 hours, uh, sometimes you'll see it if they're working in the restaurant industry or if they work at like a retail store where some weeks they're working 30 hours and some weeks they're working 25. Variable income to us, we really want to see stability. So Typically, we are taking a 24-month view and average. If your income is increasing over those 24 months, I'm going to take year-to-date as well as previous year. And whatever that average is, is the income I'm using. If for some reason we have less than a 24-month history, I could take a minimum of 12 months and still use that as long as I can demonstrate positive factors to, to kind of tell me why we don't have that. Um, again, scenarios like they were just a student and now they started in the industry and have about a year and a half worth of uh, working as a nurse and they just came out of having a nursing degree. Um, and that's something that's typical to their job. They've gotten it since they've started. I'm willing to, to use that and, um, you know, demonstrate that there are other factors, but Typically, no. Um, I would say unless you have 12 months worth of showing you're receiving that type of income, we, we tend to try and not use that. So um, if, you're, if you're trying to qualify a borrower with your overtime, I would at least like to see 12 months. 24 is usually what we look for. Um, with COVID, sometimes that does get a little bit harder because a lot of places were closed. Um, a lot of people had those times of furlough or they were kind of out of work or not working as much as they typically do. Um, unfortunately, we don't carve out the time of COVID, but 
as long as the income has stabilized and has been increasing, like I said, we're going to average that. Um, if for some reason their current year to date is a lot lower, then we are going to have to use the lower of the two. Um, so, for example, if in 2020 they were making an average of 2000 a month in overtime, but currently they're only making $800, I can't give them any more than $800. Okay, so um, what we want to look for again is just this, the stability of that variable income and the history of receipt. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? I, I had a few more questions. Yeah. Um, I, I have several actually. Has it always been standard practice that um, buyers can never speak to the underwriter, even though they're holding the key to the to kind of like the 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 pot of gold behind yeah. the door? <laughs> uh, so I will tell you, as an underwriter, I would never. Um, I, I never have spoken to a borrower, and I think the reason for that really is more of a. It's not because we don't want to have that line of communication, but there are things that uh, a processor or a loan officer may speak about or know about a client that I would prefer to not know. And that's because we don't want our judgment to be swayed when reviewing their loan. So um, if I can give you an example, if I had a borrower that came to me and they were like, underwriter, you're telling me I don't qualify my son's really sick and I just lost my mom and you know, this and that I would be like, Oh my God, I have to approve this loan. And sometimes that's something that could maybe impact your judgment and willingness to accept something that may not be acceptable um, because you're having that personal line of communication with somebody. So I think it's a better practice for us to not just because you're not having that personal relationship with someone that could potentially be a downfall to everybody. Um, you know, I think the us. flip side of that is they happen to mention to the underwriter that the uh, the gift that they're uh, using actually is money that they're keeping in the cookie jar. Yeah. You know, um, that's a conversation that's better had with the uh, loan officer. So, but your to your point, which I think is a good one, um, the clear channel communication, the way we have it set up, I think is ideal. Where although the customer may not be able to speak directly to the uh, underwriter. There's a real clear uh, and fast uh, channel communication between the filter, which is us, the loan officers, and then the decision maker. And I think it actually works better for all parties that way than if uh, the underwriter were speaking to them directly. I, I agree with you there too, Jim. And I think it's important to understand that um, Every underwriter is a little bit different. Every underwriter will interpret a document differently and have a, a different perspective on the entire picture of a loan. Um, I will be the first to say that there are times where I go, uh-uh, didn't hear that. I'm gonna forget you said that to me. And that's fine. Um, but I think it's better for a processor or a loan officer to determine what information the underwriter has um, because anything that they know or see may sway the decision that they have or the need for additional documentation. So, um, you know, like Jim said, if the borrower accidentally says, oh, no, we, we were married last year, but we're now divorced or, oh, no, my uncle gave that to me and I've just been holding it in a safe in my bedroom. Those are things we kind of want to keep from having underwriting you know, have that communication with someone. So it's not to say me personally, if a borrower was like, no, I really want to hear it from the source. I would never go. Absolutely not. I'm never getting on the phone with somebody. Um, but there are good reasons why we have an underwriter versus a processor who, you know, can facilitate that information. Okay. Thank, thank you. Um, and then uh, a follow up on that from your point of view, when you're looking at someone's file and um uh, and this is going to follow my my next question how long does it take you if you have to you know just give a rough rough estimate uh, to to determine whether this person is approved or not assuming that they had already provided you all the documentations like pay stubs you know all of that stuff uh, so Part of this conversation is actually going to lead into one of the other things I wanted to discuss. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of that after uh, we go over the questions. But 
Typically, the first time I review a loan, depending on how well the application was taken and, and if I have all the documents needed, like the pay stubs, bank statements, W-2s, probably about an hour to two hours. Um, the more involved a file gets, if they're self-employed, if they're moving money around amongst a million bank statements, um, it can take a little bit longer. But I would say on average, it takes me about an hour to maybe two hours tops to start to finish review alone. Um, after that, every time I touch a file, I'm going to say it's probably about 20 minutes to a half hour. Okay, thank you. I, am, I, want, I wanted to emphasize something that we do in our branch, which I think is a real positive, which we call first look. So our, our workflow is that once the originator brings the loan in, that's me and Alyssa. I think there's some other people in our branch, but we don't really care about them. Um, and um, we we then uh, submit the loan and uh, we have a, a loan opener who orders exhibits like verifications and appraisals and things like that. And then the loan goes straight to underwriting. So um, in our, and Jen, maybe you could give a little bit of an insight, um, but it seems to me that if I turn a file in on Monday, um, a lot of times by Wednesday or Thursday, I have an underwriting approval. So, and um, I think from your desk, when, once your once the loan goes into your um, queue for first look, I feel like you've been getting to them within 24 to 48 hours. Are those, are those right numbers? Yeah, yeah. so um, even, even when we were kind of at our busiest here, I've been a max of 72 hours. So the good thing about having an underwriter look at the loan first, um, even though there, there may not be time for a processor to grab a couple more documents and get those in before the underwriter looks at it, we're still giving you that commitment quickly, um, which is nice for a realtor to have, especially when you have a seller that may be a little bit more difficult and want to see some of those things, um, you know, as soon as possible. So, you know, to me, uh, like Jim said, when it comes to my desk, I'm looking at that loan within 72 hours. I'm issuing an approval within 72 hours. Um, Alyssa already said this, we don't like to decline loans here. So it is a very rare occasion. I am not issuing an approval when I look at that loan for the first time. Uh, sometimes there will be conditions on there that say, hey, this kind of really isn't something that we can do, but if you can get me documentation, I'm still going to give you that approval so that you can continue on in your process, but it's subject to X, Y, and Z. Okay. Um, if for some reason our ratios are over what they're supposed to be, then I'll suggest paying off a debt to qualify or restructuring the loan. But at the very least, we're still issuing that quick approval because one, that's going to look really good on your end. So, you know, you guys have those mortgage commitment dates that are weeks out from when you initially signed that agreement of sale. If you're signing the agreement on a Monday, we're turning it in on Tuesday. By Friday, you already have a loan approval to give to you know, the other agent. I think that looks a lot better than you're waiting two to three weeks for somebody to provide that to you. Lewis, did you have another question on that? Yeah, thank, uh, thanks for answering that. Yeah, my uh, last question was, uh, for us, realtors or self-employed individuals, um, and I'm not asking you to provide any tax um, you know, <laughs> advice or anything like that. But when you're, you know, but when you're looking at a tax return from a self, you know, from a self-employed individual like ourselves, what's the kind of like the first things that you see on the tax return to determine? Okay, based on their debt to income ratio, this is how much it will qualify for. That's one. And then number two, if you can just talk in general as to the do's and don'ts um, and things that you frequently see um, that uh, self-employed individuals um, uh, do in order to qualify or yeah, avoid sure. any, any mistakes. Uh, so honest answer, I am a little bit newer to self-employed, so I am not extremely knowledgeable in, in a lot of those ins and outs and things that you know may come with a little bit more involved self-employment. Um, but generally speaking, when we are looking at, I, I believe as a realtor, most of that's going on your personal 1040s. So you're kind of, you know, 1099 or however that works out. It's not your own individual company. Um, when we look at that, we actually have um, income calculators that are provided to us. So 
Whereas when I initially started in this business, I was looking at documentation and manually writing everything in myself. We do have um, certain programs or certain income calculators that kind of do that for us. Um, one of the things we do is we just take a look at your years as a whole. Is your income stable? Is it increasing? Um, if it decreased, is there a reason why and has it stabilized? So again, stability to us is really important, especially with self-employed. Um, one of the things that we do to calculate is we're really just going to take your net income that you received. So that bottom figure, we add back any type of depreciation, depletion, amortization, um, if you're writing off business use of home or any business miles or meals and entertainment, we can use a portion of that. Um, and that's where we come up with our final number. Um, I'm going to say just basically looking at a tax return, whether it's an 1120 or whether it's just your 1040, there's really no, I can eye it up and kind of give you an idea of what income we're going to use. Um, obviously, we don't want to see negative bottom line. That's one of the things, you know, right off the bat, we're going to notice. Um, but again, we get to have those add backs. So uh, Fannie Mae does allow us to add in certain things. Um, also, if you're self-employed and you're paying yourself a W-2, we can add that in as well. So um, distributions, we obviously look for. Are you taking money from your company um, beyond what salary you're providing yourself? So all those get input into what we have as a calculator and kind of give us that bottom line figure. And uh, can I give you a loan officer's perspective on that, Lewis? Yeah, I'll take it. Um, so when uh, most of the realtors that I see are scheduled, they do schedule C. And um, if you're thinking about buying a house, um, so it's very, it's very straightforward. Um, the more you write off, the less taxes you pay, the more you write off, the less you can qualify for. So, you know, you can't, you can't have your cake and eat it too. And in, in a year where you're starting to consider a, a home purchase where you're going to qualify under a standard Fannie Mae program and get the best interest rates that are available, you're going to want to write off less, probably lots less. So, um, you know, it, uh, I have a tendency to oversimplify things, but that's, that's how I would break it down for you. The more you write off, the happier you'll, happier you'll be when it's time to pay your taxes and the sadder you'll be when it's time to qualify for a mortgage. Yeah. And just to kind of um, touch on that, one of the hardest questions I think I get or, you know, conversations I have is someone will be like, what do you mean my borrower doesn't qualify? They made $3 million last year in this business. Well, that's great, but they wrote off 20, you know, thousand dollars in this. And then, you know, this amount of money and looks like they lost money after all their write-offs. So um, it's a little it's a little tough of a conversation to say that, but like Jim said, in a nutshell, the more you write off, the less money it looks like you made on paper. And that's what we're going off of. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're a billion dollar company and you're bringing in all this money, but you're writing off every single thing you can to make it look like you didn't make that much and you don't have that much that's owed, you know, at the end of the tax season, it also looks like that to us. So there's only a certain amount of income we can give you. Um, like I said, we typically will take the net income, add back your depreciation, your depletion, your amortization, which a lot of those, honestly, I don't even see. It's not something that I, I commonly see written off. Um, so you want to make sure that, you know, if, if your borrower is self-employed, they, they didn't, you know, write off 90% of the income that they have earned. Otherwise, it looks like to us on paper, you really didn't make as much money as you did. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, do we have any other questions? I had one other thing I wanted to go over. So I know we only have a couple minutes. I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, I had one question and it was just a question regarding, uh, I'm an investor and someone mentioned that if you're an investor, if you have an LLC, you can come up with a down payment, but you don't need income ratio. Is that true? Um, I, I'm not understanding what you're asking. I'm sorry. So if you have a portfolio and you have it under an LLC, there are loans out there that you can get where you need to come up with a down payment, but don't need to have an income ratio with your job or your 
personal income tax are. Is that oh, true? meaning like we don't have to verify your. Let me let me hop in. So uh, that uh, Jen does all of our conventional underwriting, uh, okay. but we we uh, we offer that type of loan separately through our sister company called FACO. Mm, okay. So um, yeah. So um, Jen will tell you Fannie Mae will not per permit anyone to purchase or refinance a loan unless they're a real person, whatever that means. It means <laughs> that you can't be an LLC. So, uh, and but most investors for uh, protective purposes and insurance purposes are going to want to own an LLC. So we have a separate company that really specializes in that. I've got two loans closing uh, this week in that product. And uh, yeah, the underwriting process is entirely different with most of the emphasis being placed on whether the property can carry the debt. Right, right. Okay, so is it okay if I contact you and you know get some more information? Yep, contact Alyssa or myself, and uh, okay. we'll, be ha we'll be happy to give you more info. All right, thank you so very much. Yes, uh, so like Jim said, I'm just a conventional underwriter, so Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, that's what I typically deal Don't with. Don't say just. <laughs> For now, so hopefully uh, so, some other things you know, in my future. But um, one of the things I did want to uh, speak to today uh, with you guys is um, our branch or Finance of America here actually is taking part in a pilot program with Fannie Mae. We are one of very few companies. I actually think there's only three of us in this pilot program, which speaks to itself on, on how well we do. And, you know, the fact that Fannie Mae chose us to do this um, shows how, how good of a company we are. But we are doing what's called single service validation. So if you ask a borrower what the worst part of obtaining a mortgage is, chances are they're gonna say, oh my God, every five seconds they were asking me for another document, okay? I'll tell you personally in buying a home, it's one of the things that I hate it. You feel like it's so invasive, you're constantly giving more documents and doing this. With this validation process, there's actually a lot less transferring of documentation. So our borrowers from the start, when they are putting in their application with our loan officers, have the ability to, through a very secure site, log into their bank statements, connect everything that way, which we actually don't see any of that information. It will generate a report and we have the possibility of validating your assets as well as your income. So that's something that you logged into one account. We don't need your pay stubs. We don't need your bank statements. That's majority of the things that we're asking for during the mortgage process. So at that point, when an underwriter gets a loan and it's validated with both income and assets, the only thing we're asking for is if anything pops up as far as the property is concerned or anything that may come up on your credit that we just kind of want a, an explanation or most of the time something internal that we're doing and the borrower isn't even aware of. Um, so to me, it's an amazing thing because one simple login to your online banking and you didn't have to provide us with anything. Um, so Jim will tell you, I'm a real huge advocate for it. There are kinks that need to be worked out. Obviously nothing runs smoothly the first time it's you know put out there. Um, but if we can't do that through the asset validation, we also have an income validation and Fannie Mae will actually tell us what income and assets we can use for qualifying and they validate that information for us. So there's no reason for us to then obtain a pay stub, a W-2, a bank statement. Um, I can't stress heavily enough, a lot of people, and I get it, um, they're a little weary to use it because they think, oh, well, now you have my online banking password, or oh, now you can go into my bank statements anytime you want. It's not like that. We use a third-party service that securely verifies the information and they give us 60 days worth of transaction history. So we're really only looking at the same thing we would have seen had you have provided me your last two months bank statements. But in the background, the systems are running. They're looking for any direct deposits that we can use as far as income. That would be your employer. If you're receiving Social Security benefits, any annuity benefits um, and things like that. So. Fannie Mae will take a, a, a record of those for 12 months and put that into an algorithm and they'll spit out a number and say, this is what you can use to qualify. 
Um, now, obviously, if for some reason we need additional income and we feel as though we need additional documentation, we'll go our standard course of, you know, obtaining those documents. But we have seen at least 20 to 25 percent of our loans coming through are getting this validation, um, which to me, if I have a pipeline of 50 loans and I have 25 percent of them where I didn't even have to verify income or assets, it's more of a streamlined process for everyone involved. And it gives us the ability to get some of those loans cleared for closing way faster than we normally would. Love a it. lot less documentation, a lot less conditions. You guys are getting cleaner commitments. Um, you're not seeing uh, you know, a two page commitment where the borrower looks like they still have to supply us a world of documentation just to you know, have that final approval. So it's to me, like I said, I'm a huge advocate of it. It's going to clean up a lot of that stuff and, and the need for additional documents. So happier borrower, happier ops team. And I would certainly think that as a realtor, you'd be a lot happier that, you know, we turned that around so fast. We got you your clear to close so quickly. And your borrower was like, man, I feel like I didn't even have to give them anything. Yeah, it was easier than I thought. We love mm -hmm. hearing that. Yeah, yeah so this, I agree so much. It's 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 a win win. Um, everybody's happier and if the income number doesn't come in the way we want it we just don't use it and we do the standard so there's no downside yeah and it there there are times where we can use that on self-employment as well um i will say that gets a little bit trickier i see a lot of times it's going to happen easier on your typical w-2 borrower getting a direct deposit um somebody who's earning that you know social security or that you know annuity Sometimes again, we can get it on self-employment, which may be nice because you see with self-employed, you feel like we're putting the borrowers through the ringer. Give me this, give me that. I want you to explain this. Oh, tell me why it looks like you wrote that off or did you get a grant from COVID? Um, these are things that we could possibly eliminate. And even on a small percentage of the loan, having that, that's still one other happy borrower and one other loan that we didn't have to spend an ample amount of time on that we can now focus on some other loans that may need a little bit more attention. Great information, I think, Jen. Um, I know we've run a couple of minutes over, but um, I think hopefully this was uh, useful to everybody. And uh, we just want to thank Jen for uh, agreeing to, you know, actually show up and show show you that there is such a thing as a human being that is an underwriter and and she's a tremendous asset to our branch Alyssa, anything you want to add it um as we uh head towards the weekend i don't think so thank you so much jen for everything and thank you guys for coming with all your really great questions great questions yeah. Yeah. and honestly uh i mean we do work very closely with you guys so any questions you have you know, send that to Jim, send that to Alyssa. They can, you know, facilitate that to me. And I, I tell Jim all the time, don't abuse it. I don't want to be sitting on the beach with my kids and, you know, taking phone calls. That's one of the reasons why I'm not a loan officer and I'm not a realtor, but I have no problem picking up the phone anytime. So if, you know, you're running into a scenario where you're like, I need this pre-approval now, or my clients are really looking for an answer, I always do my best to make myself available so that we can get that quick answer. Um, again, one of the things working at a bigger company like Wells Fargo, or even when I worked at PHH, there was no one that was just there to have that communication. Everything had a process. You had to send it in somewhere. Or it had to you know, go through 10 people to get an answer. You're not going to get that here. We're very personable. We always try to make ourselves available. Um, and we, we try to keep that relationship with you guys so that, you know, we're, we're quickly turning around those things that need to be done. Great. Well, I think this was very, very helpful. I probably learned a few things, too. <laughs> and uh, hopefully you all did as well. So um, have a great weekend and uh, let us know if you have any further questions. We're, we're here to help. Jim, can I have your email address and Alyssa as well, so I can send you some follow back follow up questions? Yeah, I'm going to put mine. Uh, Alyssa, you'll put yours in the chat too. And Jen, you're going to give everybody your cell phone number, right? Yes, that was <laughs> going to be my last. Thing. I was afraid to ask. I was like, oh. Yeah, we're no, going to keep the chain of communication <laughs> yeah. through me and Alyssa. 
Okay. Uh, and we'll we we promise to bug Jen when, whenever you ask us to. Yeah, no big deal. So much, everybody. It was nice to see everybody. Thank you so much for coming on and listening to me. Take Thank care. You, Thank Have you. a good Thank weekend. You. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.